This is the Simulated Reality Podcast. I'm Vishal, and today we have Vivekanand Pani, CEO and co-founder of Reverie Technologies. Uh, hi, Vivek. Uh, welcome to Simulated Reality. Hi. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we were talking about, you know, why you chose to go with Indic Technologies when you started, you know, your company, Reverie. And people were saying that you probably won't be making money, but then, you know, you proved them wrong. <laughs> so tell us about it. Uh, okay. So, uh, very interesting question. Uh, the fact is that we really did not start with Indic Technologies at uh, when we started Reverie. So Reverie, uh, so I and my co-founder uh, my, and elder brother Arvind, we uh, wanted to be entrepreneurs and we wanted to start something. Arvind did suggest that we should work on Indian language technologies. But I was, you know, uh, that's because I had been working on Indic Technologies uh, all through and so I had that expertise. But uh, that's the precise reason why I felt uh, not very convinced that we should do that as a business, because there would be no money. And in 2007, when we started Reverie, uh, we actually uh, uh, wanted to do mobile payments. And even mobile payments, for that matter, was way ahead of its time then, right? Okay. Uh, in 2008, there was global recession. We didn't go anywhere. And the payment space itself was not very well understood when it came to digital payments. And it was, you know, finance, uh, financial domains are very heavily regulated. So we thought that it would be, uh, you know, it, it, there is very, it's too early and it's uh, too difficult for us to keep a differentiation at that point in time. And uh, so we, uh, we shut mobile payments and then we, we thought that what is it that we can do? Arvind came back once again with the suggestion that we should work on Indian language technologies because he did see that the growth of digital, the growth of digital in uh, uh, India will happen phenomenally. And when it happens, when uh, people who, uh, who, you know, when, when people are, you know, who are using you know, their mobile phones or internet through mobile phones, when the reach grows, then uh, English would be inadequate. So that's where we uh, thought that we'll start with Indian language technologies. Uh, that's how it, it all began. But, uh, but that's, that's not all. I think there was a very, uh, very big, deeper mission that Reverie uh, had right from the start. Yeah. So um, although when we started, we didn't have any money, right? Uh, and every business uh, needs money to be able to function. We also need to make revenue, right? But uh, this mission that we wanted to connect with business uh, is, is actually the core cause. You know? uh, so we were still looking for the right time or the opportunity that we can actually connect that with business. So what exactly is this mission? The mission has been that uh, Indians, by and large, we feel that it has been a very unfair um, arrangement for them, right? It's, it's a very unfair restriction that Indians are not allowed to get into professional, uh, you know, education in their own languages. For example, you know, in the last 80 years, 75 plus years that India has been independent, we have decided for us it's not the British, it's not the Mughal, nobody else decided for us. We have been deciding for us. And in our own conscious decision, we have made it mandatory that if you were to study medicine or to study engineering, architect, or to a large extent, even agriculture, which is the fundamental profession you know, for us, we cannot do that in our own languages. So that puts a massive restriction on people who, who you know, are, are comfortable in their own native languages in the, to begin with. So uh, what tends to happen is that uh, you, if you have studied in your language, you can only you know, either do an MA in your language or you uh, are, are educated enough to be able to just read storybooks, newspaper, Tollywood, Bollywood, etc. nothing else. So uh, we thought that, you know, if, if that remains, and then that is keeping, you know, your language away from economic growth, and you will therefore be forced to look at English all the time. And it's not a very comfortable or an easy barrier to jump for everyone. 
everybody who is a genius doesn't necessarily have to have a knack or ability to learn a language very quickly, right? So that is a massive restriction that we put on our entire nation. This is our nation, our culture, our language. And that itself we wanted to kill, right? So um, in spite of all of this, the print media, which actually prints, right? is still selling 10 times more than English. That's because people love to read in their languages. It's just that knowledge isn't available in their languages as much as they would want it to be, right? So uh, that, uh, that bridge, you know, if, uh, this particular gap still could not be bridged because, you know, uh, who would print knowledge in local languages? That, you know, uh, that may not make business enough. You know, there are no exams that happen in local languages. There is no um, professional services that are available that could hire in local languages and so on. So even if you are interested, you cannot get that. But with digital, right, with the, uh, you know, introduction of internet, that particular barrier is going. It's like today, if you want to learn anything that you want, you can actually do an internet search and uh, you can start reading. The content that is available, the creator of that content may not be making money out of it because it may have been contributed by an enthusiast. So that democratic platform in the print media was very difficult. It was expensive. One could not really contribute even if one wanted to. But in the digital medium, that becomes available, right? So when that happens, we thought that this is our perhaps best and the last chance to try bridging this you know, unfair restriction and freeing our uh, you know, people to be able to at least you know, create and also make content available in their languages so that people can all, you know. So that's the, that's the thing, which is why our mission has been that we want to bridge uh, the language divide on the digital medium. Yeah. That's our mission. Uh, moving back, you know, when you started, you mentioned that you first went into the mobile payment space and there are a lot of players now. It's like a yeah. huge huge space, I mean, and also kind of a bubble, I feel, uh, that there's so many players, right? So the fintech space has really boomed. So what made you move, uh, because I, I feel this is an interesting part that we, that I wanted to ask, that what made you move from mobile payment space to then, you know, these Indic languages? <laughs> so, um, yeah, like I told you, um, Arvind and I, we were debating on different things that we want to do, and the first suggestion that came from him was to work on Indian language computing because that was my strength. But uh, only because I didn't agree that we can make money in Indian language computing. And if we are to do a business that should also sustain us, uh, we should be able to make money. So we thought, OK, let's choose, choose a different thing. And we did mobile payments, uh, thinking that commerce on mobile will actually make people uh, capable of buying no matter where they are, right? So our very initial offering were through SMS. So at that time, data, et cetera, were not so popular. Even 2G network were not you know, available everywhere. But at least the call networks were. So we thought that that's what we'll do. And uh, when, we wanted to do, when, when we wanted to do that, we wanted to differentiate by having that multilingual. Because we knew that somebody who is trying to uh, do commerce on mobile phone would still not understand English uh, all the time. Right? So we wanted to have that as one of our key differentiation that have uh, multilingual. But when we decided that yeah, mobile payments is not something that we are able to do very well, it's too early for its time, we thought that it is a good idea to stick to Indian language technologies and empower many, many businesses and services uh, that can actually offer that in local languages to the Indian population. Sure. Sure. You mentioned, you know, uh, that uh, people who create content in vernacular language, you know, in local languages may find it difficult to monetize. And you just mentioned that the content creator might not make money. Yeah. So what is that which is, you know, impeding this process? Why are, like, people who are creating in con content in local languages are not able to, you know, make as much money as people who do that in English? Uh, so, you know, you mentioned the digital divide. So what is the monetization process, if you can walk us through? Okay. This is a very interesting question, uh, and I'm happy you asked this. Um, it's a myth that uh, the non-English monetization is uh, or doesn't happen or it is difficult. Uh, let's uh, so uh, 
I'm just trying to think in what sequence should I answer so that yeah. it makes the best sense. So let's look at what uh, we tried to do in the, fir uh, in the beginning. So initially, when we started working on Indian language technologies, our objective was to help uh, you know, content uh, conversion and uh, make existing businesses make their services available in different languages. But most of these businesses, they, they told us who would consume and how. Does the phone that somebody is using right there on the street have the ability to uh, show my content in um, all the languages that I would want to? Um, the answer was really no, right? So there were most of the devices didn't even have the ability to show or display text in different languages other than English. So, uh, so we said, yeah, that's a, that's actually a problem. Now, which is the one that we should solve first? The businesses do not have a way that they can even reach out to people. And uh, if they invested in that, it is, it's not going to be monetized. When we went to device makers, they said that there is no content on the internet in Indian languages. So what is it that people will do, even if we invested in making this happen? So this still had to be broken somewhere. So we started creating the device side of technologies first and tried to solve that. In fact, the very first smartphones that had Indian language solutions, Hindi and Arabic, were created by Revery. Those solutions were created by Revery. So uh, in 2011, uh, Qualcomm wanted to introduce uh, QRD, their reference design uh, devices, in India and Arab. And the gingerbread operating system did not have uh, a, a rendering engine that could have supported non-Latin. So we replaced that with an engine that could actually support all uh, languages. And uh, when we did that, immediately the models which had Hindi support, they started selling much higher than any other models. That was eye-opening. And we may all know that Micromax Unite 2 models, they, which became the most popular uh, you know, models of, of those days, that was selling because it had 22 official Indian languages supported on the device. So, so those are the things uh, which we, when we introduced, they busted those myths that the Indian buyers do not have, uh, or they wouldn't buy, or they, would, they don't have the money to pay, right? So that was a huge myth that was busted, and following which, uh, you know, I think everybody else wanted to in, imp implement Indian languages. Today we have almost all the devices from all the operating systems supporting Indian languages natively, right? So, uh, and we have seen that uh, this particular kind of offering, when you do in local languages, this has repeatedly busted this myth that, you know, Indian languages are not selling. Now, there is a flip side to it also. There, there have been other efforts where the language implementation has still not taken off very well. For example, in spite of all this availability, the number of uh, people who know a non-English language using the keyboard to write in, let's say, WhatsApp message, right, in their own language versus using uh, the English keyboard to write their own language mes uh, message on WhatsApp, it, it's poorer, right? And there is a reason to it. Indian language solutions or the Indian language user still has to be treated like it, that language is theirs, right? It's, it's ground up created for them. What we have been seeing is that most of the efforts of providing something that is local is like, let's say we are trying to serve French food in India by trying to Indianize it, right? So it is, it is perhaps not ready for the Indian taste. It's like we are trying to serve whatever that was already available in English, done for English, by just you know giving it or converting that into a, a local Hindi or a Tamil or whatever, that is not the right taste. In fact, I'll go back and give you a very small example. When you look at the keyboard of a computer, that's a hardware. You don't change hardware. It's like physical. It just exists. But what exactly is that keyboard? What what keys does that keyboard have? That keyboard is designed to have the letters A to Z, right? So it was originally designed to have English, 
we haven't done anything. Let's say if that keyboard never existed and you wanted to do something uh, that was ground up for Hindi, you'll probably not think of that as a keyboard, right? But that is what we are trying to live with and we retrofit our languages onto that hardware because we think or we have at least you know, convinced ourselves we can't make a change on the hardware. The same set mindset also comes with everything else. I give you a hardware example because that's an extreme, right? But let's say if you have a service that is already available, that you are already serving to a lot of you know, English users, when you have to think about other, other languages, you don't have the stamina to think about it ground up. You would just think, okay, if I do localization by translating this or doing this or doing that, very, very small things, and then hope that everybody will be able to understand it, it, it actually impacts culturally. Majority of the Indian users who are seeing the internet might be actually seeing it for the first time and on this device, not on a computer, right? For them, a lot of even terminologies and icons that we are using as symbols to you know, make user interfaces, they are, not, they are not natural for them to understand. So those are the gaps that remain. So it's, it's not about monetization. They are willing to pay, they exist, they want it, but it's that, just that it's not available to them the way it, it's available for the English users. Yeah. So uh, what do you think then is the opportunity? Like how big is the opportunity in terms of monetary value when we talk about uh, you know, the use of Indian languages in different sectors, different verticals, and then integrating them with the technology stack, natural language processing, banking, manufacturing. How big do you think is the opportunity? Because obviously India is moving towards this path of digitization, you know, and but the majority of the Indian population still doesn't speak English. So then what is the opportunity, if you can tell us that? Opportunity obviously is, is uh, I mean, so I would say when we are looking at India becoming, mm, you know, <laughs> trillion dollar economies and uh, uh, the targets that we are looking at, the economic growth, uh, yeah. So uh, the number of people who would be using plenty of services, almost all the services are going to have uh, digital as the medium of service. So uh, the number of people is probably at least at least 70% of the populace, right? So the, the size is massive. And in spite of all the focus on English, we still have English fluency less than 5% in India. Fluency. I mean, you can still do business, but you are still not going to be fully comfortable with you know, the language. It's like you will still go back and use your own language when you need comfort, right? Mm. So, so therefore, this this particular gap uh, will, even if we were to depend on English, will take very very long time to bridge, or we'll probably never get bridged. We'll we'll end up having a mix of things. So, if this gap remains too long, it'll it'll continue to become more and more difficult for us to service this. Whereas if the services start becoming available now, because now is the time when all the growth is happening, if the services become available, for example, somebody who, who is very comfortable with Bhojpuri, right, and you make Bhojpuri available, then that fellow never has to go back try English. But when he gets the service late, he would have already tried English. And now you would have a substantial populace which is like now, you know, confused, you know, what to use in English and what to use in whether Bhojpuri will be available, right? So before you create that, if you are able to create services that are good enough, then the market size is actually huge. If we don't, don't do it on time, then the market size is going to be really difficult for us, for everyone. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And uh, walk us through the, you know, the biggest milestones that the company had over the last few years. What were the big milestones in terms of, you know, achieving that innovation level, uh, you know, in terms of creating your services? So if you can walk us through that. Uh, yeah. So, uh, like I said, when we, when, we, when we were starting, at that point, uh, the devices also did not have the ability to uh, display. So uh, fortunately, I had been working on Indic computing for more than 10 years when we started Revery. So I had a very deep background about developing the fundamental stack that are needed 
to make Indian language, you know, enablement on devices. And also, you know, advanced NLP that would be needed to create advanced, uh, you know, um, software to use your own languages. So when we uh, began, we started off by trying to create uh, the, the fundamental technologies like display, typing, predictions, autocorrect, right? And then we added transliteration because a lot of Indians would want to type native languages through English because English being the fundamental keyboard. You know, in those days, uh, most of the keyboards were hardware keyboards because touch screens didn't exist uh, for, for quite some time, right? So, so uh, those are the things that we made first. And that had a massive uh, impact in accelerating the Indian, te Indian language enabling, enabling technologies coming onto mobile devices. In fact, it, it accelerated so much that eventually we also got the industry to lobby and ha have uh, you know, the, the mandate to have all 22 official Indian languages supported on all devices so that there is compatibility across all devices, right? Not that you know, some of them are uh, implementing and some others who are not, in which case you still have a fragmented uh, user experience. So the Indian government ended up mandating that. By 2014, we realized that you know, most of the devices are now having uh, native support, so it's stable. We wanted to go back and enable businesses, which was our initial mission, right? We wanted to uh, uh, enable different businesses to go multilingual. So we started creating you know, uh, technologies to convert content and you know, make uh, discovery uh, technologies, et cetera. Uh, available on cloud. So we started off by trying to develop transliteration, then machine translation, search. Today we have got the entire stack, uh, NLU, ASR, text-to-speech, everything. So you, in, in fact, we were the first ones who uh, announced an Indian language uh, voice assistant, Gopal, a few years ago, right? So. Um, mm, and, and uh, so today, uh, if you look at uh, the milestones that we have covered, we uh, at different times have uh, released products that were the first in the industry for Indian languages. And, uh, and uh, today we might actually be the only Indian company that has got full stack. Uh, the only other companies that, are, uh, that may have uh, you know, all the all, uh, you know, pieces of technologies would be the large ones like Microsoft and Google, only because they are also creating operating system. Yeah, but what were the challenges? I mean, obviously Microsoft and Google are huge, huge companies, but for you, what were the challenges to get this you know, in order, get this entire stack, and then roll it out? What were the biggest challenges that you think were there? <laughs> It'll be very, very tough yeah. for me to tell all the challenges yeah. here now, because challenges haven't been technical alone, yeah. right? The domain in which we are working, let me still try telling you five, top five challenges. Sure. <laughs> so uh, one of our first challenge was to convince people uh, to help us. We, we did not succeed in that one. So when we started, we wanted to, uh, uh, so we had already burnt ourselves in Revery Technologies trying to do mobile payments. I and Arvind, both of us had exhausted our savings and we were also uh, in debts, right? So we were uh, completely broke. And so to be able to start new, we needed money. And so we wanted to look for investments, but we could not convince any investor because everybody thought that this doesn't have market. So uh, I and Arvind, we actually uh, went out begging, literally. We made a list of people among family and friends whom we can ask for money. Right, and uh, we asked for money, and uh, they just gave because we asked for the, for the money. We were, so nobody ever asked us what business or anything. They helped us personally, right? So that's what was our uh, seed into every. That's what, that was one of our first challenges. That the second challenge was uh, to be able to hire, right? So. Um, in Revery Technologies, when we, when we hired first, we actually tried to hire some really good people uh, who had some experience. And uh, they had, uh, they were, you know, so they came from really good colleges, right? And uh, 
when we hired them, we tried to pay them, uh, you know, uh, better than what they were already getting. But what we also observed is that since they ha they already had some experience elsewhere, their expectations were different. We could not give a good office. You know, there was no coffee vending machine. There were no air conditioning. There was nothing, right? So all the three uh, that we, the initial team that we had hired, they left us in about five months. So they resigned on the same day together. So that was one of my, the biggest jolt that we got. So we realized that hiring is a challenge. Thereafter, fortunately, one of them, he felt conscientious, and then he stayed back. Uh, uh, so when he stayed back, that has been one of our biggest helps. But he himself also realized that this is going to be a challenge. And uh, through his uh, network, uh, we ended up getting to Tejpur University, Assam. And we started hiring interns from Tejpur University, Assam. And that to non-engineers, MCAs to begin with. To our delight, we found absolutely fantastic technical guys from there. And guys who did not have any other distraction but a very strong fire to try proving. We need a challenge where we can we can do and we can establish ourselves, right? So that fire existed and they they put their belief in us. So that has worked wonderful. So that was the second challenge that we had. Fortunately, we solved that in this way. And most of that team, you know, so the, the, the very first team that we hired, they themselves ended up getting you know, the guys from the next batch and so on and so forth. So that we continue to do. There was a third challenge in people that we had, that whenever we had experienced people, experience helps in many ways, that when you have somebody who is experienced, you can actually speed things up. But the flip side of experience is that perseverance is low. Perseverance, for example, somebody who has already had experience will not believe in certain things, right? So giving an uphill task, which is very difficult, they will end up mocking at you, right? And these guys are like, they want to compete with Google and Microsoft, yeah, come on. <laughs> Google bhi nahi kar paaya rite din mein these guys. So whereas uh, what we thought is that if we are hiring freshers, fresh out of college, they are completely unmolded. They go by the vision that we are trying to give them. They actually put so much belief in you that you also feel responsible for that. It, it, it creates a massive, uh, I would say, it's a, it's a fantastic bonding, right? So. So they believe, right? So they try figuring out ways how they can achieve that. And they, they get mentored well. When we teach, they actually put in their hard, hard work. So that, those sort of things has worked a lot with us. And uh, fourth was, uh, was obviously convincing markets. Convincing markets was very difficult uh, because uh, uh, the people who decide, right? Let's say if we were to implement uh, or, or provide localization uh, in our business, let's say I have a business and I I am already serving the English uh, users. I want to implement Hindi and serve. But I myself am not a Hindi user, nor is there anybody in my office who is. So the decision maker himself never understands the pain of his users, right? So that sort of a person, when he has to decide, it is very difficult for us to convince, or for anybody, even for him, to get convinced or to be able to see the pain directly, right? So most of the businesses are like that. The decision makers themselves are not associated with the pain of their consumers. So therefore, that was uh, the fourth uh, uh, biggest challenge that we had, right? Now, I will say the industry thinks what the industry thinks as the biggest challenge. We also had faced that biggest challenge. But I, in my opinion, that is the last priority, which is data. <laughs> so uh, you rightly said that 
companies like Google and Microsoft, they are resource rich, right? And resource not in terms of money alone, but uh, money in people, but also of data. We did not have so much data. But we had a very strong need that whatever that we are doing must be able to earn us money. Because we don't have so much money, right? We were, we were already borrowing to be able to run our show. So we had a very strong need to be able to churn things out, which ends up creating value enough and we can earn, right? So our research was completely oriented towards the result. Very, very focused towards the result. And we knew that we didn't have enough data. So uh, we were circumstantially, uh, I would say, compelled to start thinking about you know, innovative ways to do things. And fortunately, our knowledge, long knowledge on Indian languages and their properties came in handy where we were able to produce great results with very little data. Right? So that is how today, if you look at almost every piece of technology that Revry has, as compared to Microsoft's or Google's or any other uh, uh, publicly available APIs, we stand out better in performance in almost all of them, right? So I think uh, these are the challenges we have had to deal with all of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, I want, I'm curious to ask you, so what has changed, uh, you know, uh, since then? I mean, obviously Reliance bought Revry for 90 crore rupees. I mean, so that's a great story so <laughs> far, right? Uh, so what has changed since then? And specifically from the point of view of those interns that you hired? <laughs> okay. So uh, to be very honest, I am uh, one of one of the happiest thing was that the people who uh, placed their uh, you know uh, trust on us, you know they have been taken care of. Uh, sort of they have actually you know I I feel happy that they have gained. Uh, they have gained meaningfully. So uh, we always say this at Revery that anybody who associates with us. Even somebody who is coming to us even for a three months internship or so, very short term internship during their student days. We say that when you have associated with Revery, you for your life will carry your Revery brand in your CV all the time. So we want that whatever time that you are spending here, you should be able to take something away. And we know that the most precious thing that anybody has is time itself, right? that's life. Yes. So if they are giving a part of that to us, as long as you know that, so they are able to take something away uh, meaningfully. That is what is our greatest happiness. So, with when uh, this uh, Reliance deal happened, there are multiple things that I think were key to this particular factor. Many of uh, almost all the members who joined us, more than money, their uh, key interest has been you know what impact are we able to make towards the mission that Revery is standing up for, right? This mission. And we had been looking at a vehicle. In fact, I will I will come back and tell something more about you know the vehicles that exist today. But let's say if we look at you know the reach of uh, large companies that have, uh, uh, for example, Google, right? Uh, Google, um, uh, you know, uh, the Android operating system uh, has got such a massive penetration. And similarly, Apple also has got a massive penetration. So when you look at these large companies. The vehicle itself is available to them, right? The reach is there. And if we, uh, from Revery, were to uh, make any impact happen, then we, can, we cannot make that happen unless we find a vehicle similarly large, right? So in that way, when uh, we, uh, uh, we made this association with uh, uh, Reliance, I think we got a very large vehicle. And we got this chance to be able to make impact happen. While I am, I am trying to uh, speak about the technologies that we built, which are better, but unless they also get the right vehicle, we will still not see enough visibility of those, right? So those are the two massive benefits that I think we have been able to give. One is the satisfaction in terms of achieving goals towards the mission. The other is monetary. Sure. And, uh, you know, before the podcast you were talking about, there was something that people don't know about, uh, you know, Google and uh, Amazon. Okay, and okay. So, yeah, it's not a, it's not that the, it's something the, about Google, Amazon that people don't know about. So it's the same vehicle that I would talk okay. about. So uh, 
most people think uh, or may, most people do not know that uh, Indian language computing hmm. actually did not come from Microsoft, Google or Amazon, right? Today, whatever that we are using are actually very poor technologies. Okay. They are based fundamentally, uh, they are fundamentally sitting on uh, very poor encoding standards that are, you know, I would say, imposed on us. Hmm. Indic computing started much before, and it started in India. In fact, Indian languages were the first languages outside of English that were implemented on computers. So let's say I will tell you a little bit of a story. Computers were invented, let's say, in the 1950s in the early 1950s. But that was a computing device. The need to be able to use text on computer was felt towards the 1960s. So, when computer use text in the computer, it was in English in the US. Mein, right? So, they needed to use English text and to be able to do that, they thought that when one machine has to talk to another and pass a message which is in English, then it has to follow a standard. And therefore, the English text standard was evolved. So for those people who have known, uh, you know, computing would have heard of this word called ASCII. ASCII is the encoding standard. American standard code for information interchange, which actually encodes 96 characters. 96 characters made 26 lowercase a to z, 26 uppercase a to z, 10 numbers, kuch punctuation marks, kuch mathematical symbols, or kuch uske aage symbols. The, so why is it called American Standard Code for Information Interchange? Because only these 96 characters were sufficient to use the English in America. The only currency symbol that was there that had a place in this 96 mm. was dollar. Mm. No other, no pound, nothing. Okay, so that was the encoding standard that was created. But, but, the best part is that even in creating this encoding standard for American English, a lot of very deep thought was given. The amount of thought that was given to be able to evolve this took them years. And the thought, what was, why was that thought given? So that when you use English on computers, you feel it supernatural, absolutely natural. You, 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 don't, you don't have to um, uh, think or feel that, oh, this is not right or that's not right. So whatever that you're writing, let's say, when words order, uh, arrange karte hai, apne aap sort ho karke aate hai. whether the lowercase letters should have been arranged first or the uppercase uh, should have been come first, in the arrangement of letters in ASCII, that decision, even that, has been taken care of. Whether the digits should have been uh, should have uh, been encoded first in the order, or they should have been uh, encoded last, mm. right? Where should have been where where should the space be, and so on, right? Yahan tak ki jo uppercase or lowercase characters and this is this is a unique property to, to the Latin script. So even that has been taken care of, such that. By masking just one bit, you will be able to toggle between uppercase and lowercase. So that those things make language, I mean search, let's say if you have written your own name with first letter caps or all letter caps or all letter lowercase, whatever it is, it can all be searched without any additional load. The same algorithm will be able to do all of that, yeah. right? Without any... So, these are the things that you built into the property of the encoding of your script in the first place. So that language usage on computing becomes easier. Hmm. So all of this was done in the mid-1960s. Indian languages, pe, ye cheeze 1970s. In 1988, mein Indian language ka encoding standard release hua. But the thing is that Indian language scripts have very different properties. Wahan pe ye upper case, lower case nahi hai, hmm. Right? Hmm. And Indian languages are arranged in a very you know, scientific way. Here, all vowels are together, there are five vergas in all the scripts. So, considering all of that and the display aspects of it, right? So, Indian language displays are very unlike English. Here, after one letter, there is a letter in English. 
they don't have any uh, correlation between the letters. But in Indian languages, the letters can join, right? Matras join consonants. Hmm. Consonants join consonants and for, form yuktakshars, right? Conjuncts, and so on. So Indian language writing or display, therefore, also requires a different piece of algorithm that requires different definitions. Mm. So when you are trying to design, let's say, the use of that text, where should word wrapping happen? Where should word break happen? How should the cursor jump over you know, these joined uh, characters? And how should the delete behave? How should uh, backspace behave? Copy, cut, paste, all of these, which are like fundamental requirements, right? Because these are properties of our language. So an encoding standard now, unlike ASCII, which dealt with some properties that were specific to English, and some uh, whatever else that it didn't have to bother because those properties didn't exist. But Indian language computing, they needed all of these to be defined, right? So all of these were looked at and defined in ISCII. Mm -hmm. And trust me, I do not know whether most of the uh, listeners to our conversation would have been, you know, born in uh, you know, by 1990s. Mm. But in early 1990s, India was probably the only country outside of US which had, which had the fastest growing uh, adoption of computers. Mm. Probably China as well, right? I wouldn't know. Okay. Because Chinese language bhi us samay implement nahi hua tha okay. I will tell you what happened in India. Mm. Because I have told you what happened in India. I was in engineering, I was in second year. Yeah, second year? Shayad, first year, mm. second year. In Bharat, I have told you what are the voter ID cards. I have told voter ID cards are digital. Huh. Right? Yeah. Like we are talking about Aadhaar now, and Aadhaar is big, right? Yeah. In early 1990s, all voter ID cards were being handed over in digital. Printed in local languages. Vishal, written in Vishal in Devanagari, my name Vivek, written in Odia. All voter ID data being stored in databases. Hmm. Okay. So that was, so let's say India, how many voters would they have? A country as big as India and the population of India. Kitane voters on Giosame, that scale of implementation. Land records were all digitized. Railway ka chart dekha hai. Railway charts mein, aapko railway ka chart to, computerization of railway tickets has been for very long, right? Uh, one of the first in the world. So, yahan pe, aapke uh, ticket booking ka chart in English as well as in Hindi. Okay? So, even that. And similarly, many, many others. Hmm. Plus, inside all government offices, government official communications happening in local languages by using software that were created inside India. Indian software companies were creating all of that. Not just that, the print industry in India, which I told you is 10 times bigger than the English print industry, right? And consumption also is 10 times higher. That entire print industry had adopted desktop publishing and started using very advanced Indian language software. They used to print their books. So, for example, if you are a print industry and you are creating a lot of prose, you are very naturally going to start depending on your, your software, which also does spell checking for you, uh, does grammar checking, does all the typesetting, mm. you know, um, justifications. Now, like I told you, justifications karne mein word break kahan hona chahiye, kahan pe kis tarike se, uh, you know, let's say if you are underlining, headlining, whatever that you are doing, how should that behave for Indian languages and spell checking? All of those advanced tools, which even today, Microsoft or other word processing software do not have it well for Indian languages at all. Mm. All of those were being used by Indian publishers. In the year 2000, Microsoft said, we will implement Unicode, not ISCII. And Unicode, what is it? ISCII was created in 1988. Unicode was created in 1991. Unicode, ISCI is a, it's our national standard. Unicode is an industry consortium. Matlab kya hai? Ke America mein, char panch companies, jo ye computers lekar ke dunia mein bechte the, unke software bhi unke saath saath bechte the, they thought 
that in geographies like India and elsewhere, where people are buying computers, they need their languages, and they are trying to do something on their own. If we make our software work with each other properly, then they will not be able to do that. That's it. So they formed a consortium to be able to agree on things that would work among themselves first. That is the reason why Unicode was formed. And since 1991 until now, Unicode continues to have their consortium meetings only in America, hmm. Silicon Valley. Man. Now, America already had their standard ASCII, right? Yeah. Unicode was formed for the rest of the world. But in the rest of the world, there are no meetings in the rest So the fact is that when Unicode was formed in 91, they first thought that, okay, which all languages can we include? They found that other than ASCII, there was only one other country which had already done for 12 languages, India. Yeah. वहाँ से उन्होंने इसकी 1988 का डॉक्यूमेंट उठाया एंड उनको पता है एसकी जैसे इनकोडिंग करते हैं तो एसकी में सिर्फ कैरेक्टर्स हैं लेकिन इंडियन लैंग्वेजेस में इट्स नॉट जस्ट द कैरेक्टर्स देर आर सो मेनी अदर थिंग्स दैट आई जस्ट स्पोक अबाउट विच हैव टू बिकम अ पार्ट ऑफ द स्टैंडर्ड राइट बट टू देयर नॉलेज आई थिंक ऑल दैट दे थॉट दैट पिकिंग अप द लिस्ट ऑफ कैरेक्टर्स इज इनफ ओके एंड दे जस्ट डिड दैट दे इग्नोर एवरीथिंग एल्स अबाउट इंडियन लैंग्वेजेस अनफॉर्चुनेटली इंडियन लैंग्वेजेस they also have a display complexity right yeah. which was completely controlled within the operating systems and the operating systems they did not open that up to be replaced with anything else that you do for indian languages yeah. right so yeah. they started to implement unicode that way by defining their own stuff in the year 2000 microsoft first introduced hindi in unicode on microsoft operating systems unfortunately at that point in time the indian government or whoever were deciding for India did not tell Microsoft or the American companies which were implementing Unicode that you should also have a backward compatibility with our national standard because mm. we have already kept so much of data and the whole industry is already flourishing using yeah. right our standards. You should have some backward compatibility with it. They just did not bother. Why, why do you think they didn't pay attention to that part? I think uh, it may have been lack of... Uh, lack of... Research? Like no, lack of concern, okay. lack of knowledge. Okay. Uh, or maybe, uh, I don't know, but maybe ill motivation. Because something of, something of such a large or big importance, such a huge importance, usko is tarike se ignore kar dena. Hmm. Today... But now they are coming to India, right? They, I mean, India is now one of the biggest markets now oh, going sorry, forward. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry but, to interrupt you, but yeah. So... You're saying that Microsoft ignored it at that point of time, but what are they doing now? You know, obviously now, how, so what do you think is like the future of Indic computing now going forward? Uh, so, so do you think that these standards will be improved or will it remain kind of the same? I think some effort in improving the standards might be happening now. Uh, they are happening, but the, the, the fact remains that, you know, all the good work has already been forgotten and tremendous amount of data that was actually, so today, if you look at advanced technologies in machine learning and uh, in creating many different tools, the most important thing is data, right? And data that took clean data, good data. That data availability for Indian languages has gone. And with the poor encoding standard, what you end up doing is whenever you are creating any data, you are also introducing a lot of noise into it, right? So Indic computing has already become difficult and it will remain so forever. Because we, we really can't go back and correct all of this at this stage. The, 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 the consortiums and the authorities or the, or the people who are trying to do that, uh, they, they, they find it now overwhelming because it's like way too many parameters over this large period of, uh, long period of time, mm. right? So that is what I would say is the thing. The vehicles which have had the reach, they practically killed uh, whatever good so it can't be corrected now. Uh, is it like, is there a way to correct it so that we have like good products in future? You know, good LNLP it, consumable products or like it, a, it can be corrected. But to be able to correct, yeah. there is there is a huge motivation that is required. There's a huge 
um, energy that is required no, to go back and try. The monetary motivation is there, right? I mean, India oh, is like such a so, uh, big market. No, no. I think that is another myth. Okay. Uh, monetary motivation always existed in India. Okay. But poorer st things that still sold in India because people, if when people have no choice, they will buy whatever is there, right? So if you give them a choice, they will probably prefer a better one. But today, the industry has taken up standards that are poorer, and if that is all that is available, Indians are buying that anyway, mm. right? You but don't it doesn't apply to voice products, right? Like, or does it like the voice assistants that we see? Does it apply uh, in any way to the? So voice, I I would say that because of all of this, I think voice is a really great choice in terms of just making an interface happen. But interface is not everything, mm. right? Interface is not, so let's say you will still want to write, you will still want to read, mm. you will still want to type. If, let's say, if you are uh, an author, you would still want to use the computer to be able to type and do a lot of things on that. You would, you would still search, you would you'd do many things, right? And all of that would still continue to give you a very poor experience. So because of the poor standard, what impact do you see currently on the web? Of all these things. Like I told you that on the web you find whatever Indian language data that is available very noisy. Okay. Right? You compare, let's say you scrape a lot of, uh, let's say, GBs of data in English and GBs of data in Indian languages. If you compare the quality of data, you will find that Indian language data is noisy and poor. Okay. Okay. Because of poorer standards. Right? So when, when you are getting this kind of data, making use of that to create any other tools will also be poorer. So, you know, something like BERT, we, we might not see that in Hindi, right? Something, these kind of models you, will be very difficult. You, you can use BERT, of course. You will be able to do... The exact same algorithms will still continue to give you better results on English than on Indian language. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, a lot of rework is required, right? In that, that, in that that's context. right. So, there are certain other ways also. For example, if every developer understood the nature of the those uh, you know difficulties or the nature of the noise then they may come back and work so but then they will have to be like linguists they will have to go back and learn probably these languages learn them very well and yes, then go yes, integrate yes, that with that, that's right so which means that we have already created a lot of difficulty for the software engineers or the engineers who are trying to create solutions for their languages or other indian languages for them it is still a, it's a, it's a very big difficulty Right? Mm. They may not have to become full-fledged linguists, but they will still have to do a lot of struggle in trying to understand how display works, what, what sort of errors are happening because of the encoding, etc., etc. Mm. Now, if you can just talk, uh, you know, about your services right now, one of it is, you know, language as a service model that you have. So, yeah. if you can just talk about, you know, how you are using this across different companies and, you know, how your customers are using it. Um, so yeah, so language as a service is uh, is, a, is what we thought way, way back in 2014-15 when we wanted to put whatever language technologies that we are creating on cloud, mm. right? So that different businesses can uh, uh, use those. So we have from there on continued to offer all of these as APIs for direct use. So we also had some uh, applications and tools. For example, we also used to give SDKs that people can use to create mobile applications right, on, on device, uh, which are still available. But I think majority of uh, the uh, services today are directly able to benefit from cloud APIs because most of the devices are, you know, constantly connected mm. and so on. For a lot of offline services, we continue to provide SDKs that can work. Great. Uh, so, and what is your vision then going forward? You know, how do you see like this, uh, you know, do you see that there will be systems, you know, in which developers could create machine learning models in Hindi or other Indic languages? Do you, do you see it happening smoothly, uh, you know, in the future? Yeah, of course. There are quite a lot of uh, companies. Um, in fact, I feel very happy when I look at the, the new age uh, entrepreneurs that are coming. Many of them are still students. I mean, uh, recently we had a hackathon yeah. where the, the first prize winners were uh, ninth or 10th class students from uh, school, NPA school here in Bangalore, yeah, right? So, and these students are thinking about India specific problems and they are not really worried about, you know, doing something uh, high funda for the, uh, um, uh, for, for the international world or something like that. They are still thinking about, you know, doing it in Indian languages for the mass Indian population, mm, right? Yeah. So I think with that sort of motivation, I'm sure they will be able to create a lot of... Um, in fact, I have also met 
teams other than our own uh, where people are working on pretty you know uh, original algorithms in machine learning which are uh, uh, you know very creative and uh, uh, you know often able to give better results for specific indian uh, uh, solutions uh, that that are needed but do you think that uh, you know english being become english becoming like this first language for the elite class in india do you think that's an issue for you know growth in this market especially if you look at it from the point of view investors because you know english has become like this first language for people who have you know good education so do you think that's somewhere an issue or it's not an issue in the sense that people also give due importance to the fact that it's a huge market and you know you need to develop systems and technologies and uh, local languages as well so i told you why yeah. english has been an elite language yeah. that is because we made sure that the growth in economics can happen only through english mm. right if you did not know english yeah. you cannot get into a professional this is like a cycle so, yeah so yeah. so that's why now if that particular cycle itself is getting broken then it's a matter of 5 or 10 years within which this entire perception itself can be blown off yeah. right so in which case well who really cares yeah right so english is today as we speak english users still appear to be the most mature ones right because they have seen they have found the access they have also yeah. been able to get services and therefore they are able to use and therefore they are more matured but the indian language users if you know if if the barriers for them are broken it, it's just a matter of very short time yeah now i would also like you uh, you know to tell about uh, the work that you're doing if there is any research work uh, you know at revry if you if you'd like to tell about that yeah so uh, i personally have been uh, a researcher mm. um, the only difference that i'm i do not do a lot of academic research i try to do research by, which can have a result that can mm. solve a field problem so uh, yeah we we constantly do a lot of research work um right now as we speak we are focusing a lot on um quite a few uh, key research problems like speech to speech translations and uh, discovery in speech mm. that is let's say you have a lot of voice data and how can uh, you actually do discovery on that and analytics on that uh, we are also working on a lot of uh, uh, of course text based analytics and research is something that has uh, that we have been doing for many years now so is a focus only on the indian languages and you mentioned arabic so is there a focus on maybe oh, so, probably some other languages yeah so i told you that yeah. the first android or smartphones yeah in the world that had you know <laughs> indian languages came from uh, revry. revry right yeah. so that solution we grew from two those two languages hindi and arabic to 35 languages okay. so which included many languages of the world so we are definitely not restricting ourselves to indian languages but we understand that india itself is a very yeah. rapidly growing and i to as i told you there is a mission behind which we are after yeah. so we are that's why trying to focus on that a, a lot but at the same time we are also working on many other non indian languages yeah. uh you know reliance is geo it kind of close a gap this digital divide gap where now people across india have access to cheap internet yeah do you think the next part here is obviously language and that is why they acquired you and that that you would add tremendous value in you know developing this ecosystem that is that's like given yeah uh so uh there are three fundamental things that can make services available to people yeah right apart from the price points or the sure. affordability which today is not not a concern as much the three things are devices infrastructure and languages right so devices people now have infrastructure with geo now we have the reach almost everywhere the third is languages mm. without which people will have difficulty coming on to the net and connecting with it yeah yeah i mean that was uh, you know great uh, knowing about all of these things because i i didn't know uh, these things and uh, you know great having you here thanks a lot for your time awake i uh, really appreciate it thanks vishal yeah. uh, it was a pleasure talking yeah, to you yeah great thank thanks. you so oof